So I wanted to welcome you all to our fourth educational event, part of our fall speaker series uh, regarding climate change and sea level rise. And uh, we've got a couple more events left, and the next one's going to be a film, which will send an email blast out and remind you again that it's uh, coming up. So I just wanted to get a quick show of hands of how many new people are here. Um, uh, this is your first event that uh, you're coming to. Okay. And uh, just out of curiosity, how many people have learned about these events through the newspaper? Um, email? Um, the sign out front on the street? <laughs> That's new, it's only two, two days old. But we'll have that out a little, uh, little sooner next time around. But. Okay, so. We're a storm surge, and we're a group of concerned citizens, and we're trying to educate our communities about the changes that are coming ahead. And uh, our strategy at this point in the game is to uh, spread awareness and educate people such as yourself so that you might get inspired to go out and talk to some other people that aren't really paying too much attention to the, uh, the climate issue. So why is climate science, um, the science part of it actually, uh, why is it a political issue? I mean, it is just science after all, correct? I mean, we've analyzed all the best data, we've fed it into supercomputers, and then we've had some of the world's best scientists uh, look it over, and with 95% certainty, they're stating that uh, climate change and sea level rise are due to human activities, and we better get prepared because there's some big changes on the way. But climate change seems to be in some circles almost like a religion. You can either believe in it or you don't believe in it. But in reality, um, you can really only choose to acknowledge it or ignore it because facts are facts. So, for many people, they actually don't really have a problem with climate science. What they have a problem with is the results of the science. And the problem is that the results are actually pretty scary for most people. And so what we get into is this issue of how do people react to different fears that they may have. And when people uh, become scared, they have different reactions. And to uh, sort of illustrate this point, I'd like to take a simplified look at the Titanic disaster. So at some point when they were cruising along in the dark, somebody on the bridge said, hey, there's an iceberg, and we can't turn this boat fast enough, and we're going to hit this thing. And so. They had this problem, and they knew it was going to be a problem. And it hadn't arrived yet, but it was coming. So people fell into three camps in terms of how they dealt with this problem. You had people on the bridge who said, well, let's minimize this impact. Steer the boat hard right or left. I forget which side they hit on. But let's try to avoid this impact as best we can and minimize you know, casualties and the extent of the damage we're going to sustain. Then there were a group of people that conceded, hey, this is going to happen. The boat's going to go down. We've got to start getting the passengers ready and the lifeboats ready and basically conduct an evacuation of the ship. And then there was the third group. And they basically chose to ignore the problem and they just partied on until the ship collided with the iceberg, started to sink, and then panic set in. But at that point, it was too late to do anything and so many people uh, perished as a result. So you can see that there's some parallels here between climate change and that disaster. We've got people falling into these different groups. Um, just to illustrate another point, the North Carolina State Coastal Resource Commission, like the International Panel on Climate, uh, Climate Change, predicted that sea level would rise roughly a meter, maybe a little bit more, by 2100. <coughs> and they began one of the first efforts in the country to prepare their state for the future impacts uh, of climate change. But the prediction of all of this water required a lot of adaptation, presented, with North, presented North Carolina, like many other coastal states, with, major, with a major set of problems that they had to deal with. They had infrastructure like roads, schools, government buildings, wastewater treatment plants, in some cases entire communities would need to be relocated. Then the inundation maps also showed expensive existing coastal properties to be going underwater, and then planned future real estate developments were also going to be underwater. So, who in their right mind would want to buy a property there? So what was really pressing was this uh, prospect that their entire coastline, the, uh, the real estate values would plummet, 
and the flood insurance rates would go through the roof. So the legislature did something that was fairly unprecedented to deal with the problems created by these sea level rise projections. They simply passed a law and said that these sea level rise projections are illegal. We can't talk about that. <laughs> so, they passed a law essentially banning the state from basing any of their coastal policies on the latest scientific uh, predictions of how much uh, sea level would rise in the future. So they basically solved their problem. They didn't have to relocate any roads, didn't have to uh, uh, you know, worry about flood insurance going up, so on and so forth. So basically, the government in North Carolina fell into this party on group uh, on the Titanic, and they're basically sticking their head in the sand. But I think we can all agree that this isn't a sound strategy for uh, society's survival in the future. And we all need to get these polarized groups on the same page relative to this climate change issue so that we can start to apply the brakes to you know, the, the climate impacts that we're going to have, and also so that we can adequately, in a civilized manner, and not following every disaster, try to adapt and, uh, and prepare for this, because uh, changes are coming. Now, John Anderson is here to tell us how we're going to accomplish this, and <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> he's, a, he's a pretty smart guy. He's director of education at the New England Aquarium, and he's earned a uh, bachelor's in biology from Oberlin College. He also has a master's in cell physiology from Boston University. He's a senior fellow um, of the Environmental Leadership Program, and he's collaborated on several education projects about climate change. And he now directs the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, where, through collaboration and maybe finding some common ground, he's trying to get these polarized interests together to come and do something about the problems that we face. I'd like to welcome John. Mike, thank you very much, and uh, Sheila, thank you very much for reaching out and inviting me. I'm really, I'm pleased and honored to be here, and um, I cannot promise that I have all the answers, um, but I hope that I can stimulate you to um, perhaps have some new ideas this evening. And I want to um, start by reflecting on why I think I'm really here, why, why I chose to be here, and it, it really um, comes down to the idea that I'm grateful. I'm grateful because I'm aware of work done by people in generations gone by to do things such as create a public uh, school system, public education, to create roads and bridges that allow one to get from Boston to Newburyport in an hour. Um, it's pretty, pretty nice. Um, we have clean water, sometimes in bottles, um, that we often take for granted. and. All of these things that sustain us, that make our lives quite uh, healthy, we often take for granted and they all came from work of people over the generations um, that lay the groundwork ahead of us. And I'm quite concerned that in our day and age, we need to lay the groundwork to leave the world better, um, or at least as good, for our children and, and future generations. And that's really why I'm here, because I think we can. I think we can, I think we need to find ways that each one of us can participate in doing that. Um, and I take it that you all agree, and that's why you're here, so thank you for that. Um, we have lives that are better because we can drive when and where we want to, and so can emergency vehicles. Our lives are better because we can heat our homes in the winter, and we can cool them in the summer. Our lives are better because we can have light anytime we want with the flick of a switch. There are many, many things that are improvements to life, but what we understand is that there are side effects of um, doing those things or having those things. And a few decades ago, my parents brought me home from the hospital in a car. And that car burned gasoline in its engine. And that gasoline, as it burned, mixed with oxygen from the air and made carbon dioxide, which came out of the tailpipe quite invisibly. My parents 
probably had no idea. And they certainly didn't know that that carbon dioxide from the gas burns bringing me home from the hospital would still be there today. Not all of it, but a good part of it's still there today. So what we're wrestling with has a very long lag time. And I'm seeing nodding. I, I'm, I'm going to cover some material, forgive me, that you already know. Uh, maybe not all of you know. Um, but we do understand this today. And so I think it's good to remember and reflect on what we often take for granted that comes from all the work before us. And also to take a moment to say, now what can I do about the side effects? Um, the systems are large and complex. Each one of us, and I'm going to come back to this later, each one of us only gets to see a little tiny piece. And so um, that's, that's one of the big challenges before us. Um, so that gives a little overview of why I'm here. I have some goals for this evening. These are goals for you. I'm hoping that you will leave here with something to be interested in, something you something um, you are interested in learning more about. I hope that you have uh, concern, and I hope the concern that you feel doesn't achieve the level of uh, emotional gravity that you would call it fear. Because fear may be real and there may be reasons for it, but it's not the emotion that will sustain us. And the work before us is much more like a marathon than a sprint. So we really need sustained um, concern Year, I don't think is going to get us there. And then I already mentioned the idea that each of us can participate, so I hope you'll feel hopeful. I'd like you to, I'd like you to leave with a sense of hope. So, according to my um, title, I'm here to talk about mitigation and adaptation and some ideas for communication. So I'm going to touch on mitigation and adaptation fairly quickly um, that's not actually my specialty area, but I do think it's very important and bears, um, bears a few remarks. And then I want to um, share some fairly concrete ideas, one in particular, very concrete idea that I think you can use. Um, you could use, for example, in Thanksgiving gatherings. So I'll come back to that at the end. Um, and uh, that has to do with a mental model and a framework for considering solutions. So mitigation versus adaptation. Um, if you see a dangerous situation and you act to prevent something bad happening, that's mitigation. If you find something bad is happening and you say, let's change to reduce the damage, that's adaptation. That's one way of saying it. This is from the internet. I have no idea if this is photoshopped. <laughs> um, but you can see there's a potential for a problem that might want some attention. Um, this is a way I thought about it. As I thought about this, I said, what's the difference going on here? And I thought, well, maybe this would make some sense. Mitigation is the stitch in time. <coughs> adaptation is the nine that you have to do if you don't stitch the one in advance. Well, in the climate system, there's a lot that's really already underway. We've missed a lot of those initial opportunities for stitches. And so there's momentum in the system. It's going to keep changing. So we need to start both. And I don't think we can depend on mitigation at this point alone. We'll, we'll need to uh, be adaptive. Um, so I walk my kids to school in the morning. And we stop dutifully at the light and push the button and wait for it to say, the walk light is on. The walk light is on. And I say, well, okay, so it's safe to cross, right? But I ask my kids, I stop. Whatever we're talking about, I interrupt. And I say, now watch the cars. Because maybe some of these brakes aren't going to work as they approach the intersection. So we, we face on a personal level every day, many times. If you ever wait for the train, you know, do you, know, you stand on the yellow line? No, you stand back. You know, if the sea level's rising, do you stand on the edge? Yes, a lot of people do. 
right? Should we? Well, there's a lot of concern about that, and, and there are a lot of issues embedded in that. But we actually, we actually take um, safety steps all the time. But notice that the time scale and investment, interrupted <coughs> conversation to say, make sure the brakes are working on the car is approaching, it's immediate. It's at a scale that we can manage cognitively. Our brains work that way. <coughs> Much harder when you're talking about a 30, you know, you're talking about a, a, a car coming over the course of 30 or 40 years. It's a much, much more difficult cognitive kind of task. But we need to engage in that kind of task. Um, adaptation is response to change. This is taken, actually, you're going to have uh, Paul Kirshen coming. And I, I think the next two slides, actually, he may show you. I think they're from work he, he participated in. But let me just say, I'll, pre I'll preface something that I expect he'll talk about, which is that just taking Boston as example, an example. Have any of you been to the new convention center in Boston? Just a few of you. Well, the entire area, I mean, from my view at the aquarium, I've watched hotels go up. Like, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. I once heard a guy talking about China and Beijing. He, he was away from Beijing for five years. He went back. He couldn't find the house he grew up in. He said the national bird of China is the crane, <laughs> the construction crane. You know, so, so the Van Pier area, Boston's like that. Well, it's, it's pretty close to sea level. And so some pretty smart people have been getting together and they said, you know what, if you're building a building in Boston that's greater than 50,000 square feet or something, don't put anything important on the first floor in the basement. Unless you build the basement like a submarine. Because you've got to just assume first floor flooding. Just assume it. So um, have any of you heard the story of the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital? Raise your hand if you've heard this story. Many of you have, so I'll be quick. Basically, they didn't put anything in the basement. They put all the, the utilities that would normally go down below sea level, they put them on the roof or somewhere else. They did a whole bunch of things to make that building um, not only rated as a green building by the um, what's called the LEED standards, um, but they, they really did plan for sea level rise. At the aquarium, if you've seen our renovations from a couple of years ago, you'll notice that the walkway outside is both more beautiful than it used to be, and it's also elevated. You know, we still, we, we um, about 10 years ago, we invested about a million dollars to move the electrical closet from the basement to the second floor. Um, you know, costly stuff, but, but we recognize that we need to do these sorts of things. Um, if you're building new, you know, try to get it right from the start. Um, you know, that building, the, the aquarium building was designed in the 1960s, so we didn't really have this issue on our radar screen yet. And we're trying to play catch up like so many others are. Um, I think you know the next few slides, so I'm going to go through them quickly. But what I really want to emphasize here is we've got 7 billion people on the planet. This is not just about us. You know, when a hurricane hit in the Philippines, people around the world want to reach out and be helpful. We care about each other around the world, and um, big events are happening at an increasing frequency, um, and that's essentially what this is saying. So there are multiple trends that all indicate essentially the same thing. The climate shift system is changing, and I, as I say, I think you know this, so let me go through quickly. Weather and climate disaster trends, this is based on um, billion dollar events, seems to be a trend of increasing billion dollar events. Global average temperature anomaly, that means the difference from the long term average is increasing. Global ocean heat content, um, you know, there's been, there's been a lot in the news about how the global temperature has sort of been stable the last 10 years. Well, the ocean's carrying 90% of the heat that's been trapped. And people don't really see that when they see the average global temperature. The heat content in the ocean matters tremendously. The uh, ice in the Arctic is uh, the, the average annual um, sea ice minimum is going down well, uh, much faster than, than models projected. Around the world, glaciers are melting. In the upper right, if you can see the little red dots, those are all the glaciers that are being measured, reflected in the trend in the graph that shows the trend. Heat records are being broken at about twice the rate that cold records are being broken. You still have, 
you know, it still gets darn cold, and there's still record cold spells and cold events around the world. Um, this is from the United States. Um, but the rate at which heat records are falling is much faster. And this is important um, for ocean folks. The green part of this in the lower right, that downward trend is pH. And the, the pH of the ocean is um, still, still very much in the alkaline end. It's, it's above 8, but it, but the, and it's not the same in all parts of the ocean. It's not, not, the ocean isn't totally even everywhere. But, um, but the trend is very clearly um, towards the acidic direction of the scale with, with great consequences to many, many biological processes. So, there are multiple lines of evidence. We get it. It's, the, the climate's changing, and there are 7 billion plus people on the planet, probably going to 9 billion in the next few decades. We don't know exactly, but that's an awful lot of people, and around half of them live in the coastal zone, where sea level and uh, coastal storms matter immensely, let alone, you know, the tornado events. And I don't understand how tornadoes work at all. Um, I don't know how they connect to, to climate change, but my, my personal perception is it seems like there are more tornadoes in, you know, than I remember from my childhood. I don't know that statistically. We need experts. But um, extreme events seem to be um, mounting. So I've already alluded to this. We've got a, a big challenge because our brains don't think about pH measured over time in a graph. This isn't, this isn't really what resonates for our brains. Our brains work on a scale that we can see. Face-to-face -face works. You know, watching from a seawall as waves come in, that, that catches attention. Um, our, our ears here <clears throat> over certain distances, you know, we can touch, we can taste, we can smell, but we don't, we only get a tiny slice of the bigger picture. And that's part of why the, the work of getting attention and action related to changing systems is so challenging. So here's a way of looking at that. Do you know what this picture is? Anybody ever drive in a traffic jam? Ever get frustrated when you're in a traffic jam and somebody squeezes in front of you? Yeah, that's like this picture. You're up close. You only see what's really right in front of you. Um, if you pan back a little bit, you know, like maybe you get a, um, maybe you're you're in a helicopter looking down. You start seeing, okay, there's there's a traffic pattern here. You start seeing what the picture is a little bit more, a little differently. You zoom out some more, and you start seeing not just where the traffic jam is, but now you can start beginning to see the whole layout of roads. You might even be able to see alternate routes. You might even be able to see how the system of roads um, causes the constriction. You know, But when you're in the traffic jam up close, and that person pulls in and cuts you off, you're really frustrated with that person. Well, I didn't make the traffic jam. But you can't see that when you're so close to it. Now you see the picture? Yeah. So the trouble is, we live in this. And what we need to be able to see is these kinds of trends. And that's hard. So, um, so I want to give you some something concrete to hang on to that you may be able to use. I'm going to talk Thanksgiving again. Happy Thanksgiving in advance. Um, so, I, I try to give an overview of why I think I'm here and why I think we're all here. Um, and a, just a little bit about mitigation versus adaptation with, with uh, really touching lightly. Um, and I want to try to help you wrestle with this concept of what do we do about this issue of scale. So, I have a few ideas. One thing I want to mention is that Americans are more interested than we think they are which I think matters. Simplifying can be helpful. I think it's important that we foreground in our mind effective solutions. I'm going to talk more about that. I think it's important that we find a way to envision something better. Um, I think talking about how we need to stop driving, and we need to stop using electronic devices, and we need to stop and stop and stop and you know disrupt our lives. Um, 
It's not so appealing. It's not very fun. Um, so we need to envision a better future, and I think we can. And I think we can share examples from, you know, there are lots of people doing good work already. And I think we can celebrate and share stories about that. So I come from the world of aquariums, New England Aquarium in particular, but we're working with zoos and aquariums and uh, national estuarine research reserves and other kinds of nature centers across the country. And collectively, we have a lot of visitors. New England Aquarium has about 1.3 million a year, but when you talk about all zoos and aquariums, it's around 130 million. You add in museums of science, you add in all the kinds of nature centers. You know, we see most Americans at least once a year at one of these kinds of institutions. So if those institutions can find a way of doing something productive from a, from a conversation and education standpoint, I think we can make a difference. And I also think that all of us can make a difference in our personal networks, our friends, our families, our neighbors. Um, we can reach a lot of people. So we can stimulate productive conversations. All of us can participate. Um, what do I mean Aud audiences are more interested when we think than we think? Um, at the Northwest Zoo and Aquarium Association, they surveyed their visitors and they found two-thirds, more than two-thirds, said uh, climate change is really the most pressing issue we've got to face related to the environment. And the Ocean Project found something similar. They, did a, they do a lot of survey work and they found a similar kind of thing. When we, um, when not we, when another project surveyed at national parks, they surveyed, can't remember the numbers, I think it was about 800 national park employees across five regions of national parks. And then they interviewed or they um, surveyed over 4,000 visitors. Among the park staff, 9% thought their visitors were pretty interested in climate change issues. Among the visitors, it was over 60%. So educators, in my world, are misunderstanding the level of interest. And I think that that's a challenge and a problem. So we need to, we need to uncover that interest and bring it to the foreground. Um, why does that happen? Well, it's because when people come to visit the aquarium, they ask, where's Nemo? Do you have Nemo here? Or they ask, why doesn't the big one eat the little one? So have you ever heard, how many of you have a uh, Seafood Watch card in your wallet? A few of you. I don't. I love the idea, but I still don't have it. Um, seafood Watch card is essentially a, a, a handy, quick reference. You can go in when you're buying seafood and you can say, well, green choices are pretty sustainable. Yellow choices, maybe not quite so sustainable. And red choices, pretty unsustainable. And it's a quick guide to, as a consumer, what can you do? You can ask questions. Was this salmon? You can ask it the, when you're buying the salmon. Was it, was it caught on a hook and line? Was it farmed sustainably? Where, where does it come from? How was it caught? You, know, you can learn to ask questions. Well, imagine the world, if everybody coming to an aquarium or a zoo or a nature center came in asking questions like, so how's my life connected to this lion? or to this lionfish. How, you know, when I'm brushing my teeth, what might I think about that connects me to a coral reef? What if we were asking those kinds of questions? I think we'd have, I think our educators would love it. I think they would really delve into the kinds of conversations that I think are possible that could make a difference. <coughs> um, this is just for, this is, uh, I haven't even explained what this graph is. It's, it's not that important except to say the red bars represent visitors at 10 zoos and five aquariums surveyed in the summer of 2011, I think it is. Yeah. And um, the green bars represent a, a uh, randomized selection of Americans across the country. So zoo and aquarium visitors seem to be much more concerned than the general American public. So. When Americans are asked to describe the mechanism of climate change, what do you think they say? If I were to ask for one of you to explain how does climate change work, would anybody be willing to come up and explain it? Come on up. Are you, are you willing? Okay, come on up.
carbon dioxide or methane or some, certain other gases <clears throat> are effectively transparent to visible light or to most of the, the um, electromagnetic energy that comes incident upon the Earth. But they're not transparent. In fact, they're reflective to infrared, which we think of as heat or one form of heat. And when all the other incident energy hits the surface of the Earth, it changes, changes wavelength, and is re-radiated. It's either absorbed by the Earth or it's re-radiated as infrared. And when it's re-radiated as infrared because of increased CO2 or methane <coughs> or other uh, greenhouse gases, it, uh, it doesn't go away. It stays here and it heats the atmosphere. And then it's transferred from the atmosphere to the ocean, to the land surface, to weather systems. That's pretty much it. Brilliant. That was impressive. And thank you for thank you for your um, willingness to step up without any preparation. Now, how many people understood? Pretty pretty good. Okay. In this crowd, you're pretty well understood. If you walked out on the street and said all that, how many people do you think would understand? Probably not a lot would be my guess. I, I, I think you did that brilliantly, and I want to make a claim. No, I don't want to make a claim. I want to show a video. So, um, I want to show this video, but I need to introduce it first. This is a video that is part of a research project done in Canada in several years ago, back in, I think, 2007. And um, the, the, the same kind of work has been done in late 2012 and early 2013 in the U.S. It was done in the U.S. previously, but the video happened to be made in Canada. So, just preamble. The other, the other thing that's important about this is there are a number of sociological and anthropological kinds of studies that led to this video being produced. Our colleagues at the Frameworks Institute, who's... No, they're not shown on here. Um, our colleagues at Frameworks Institute, which is a, a nonprofit um, consulting firm that consults on communications issues, um, they have a, a multi-step and multidisciplinary approach to asking how, within a cultural group, how are people thinking about a particular issue, and how are those common ideas different from how experts on that issue think about it. So they identify gaps. And then they start experimenting with different ways of trying to fill the gaps. So this video is at the end of that experimental cycle. And we'll, we'll get into this. So let me see if I can get it to play. As part of Framework's effort to demonstrate the effectiveness well, of okay. a simplifying model for global warming, we first asked researchers at Cultural Logic to assess people's default responses to the topic. When you ask Canadians what causes global warming, most people are unable to offer a coherent explanation. Can you tell me what you know about how, how global warming works? Where does it come from? Glaciers melting? <laughs> Pollution? <laughs> Tons of reasons. We've had two ice ages and we're turned ice and got warm again. It could be natural, it could be anything. We've had uh, meteors and, and comets hit the earth and cause global warming. Right now, man is causing it, but don't mean it's good, don't mean it's bad. Um, just, I don't know. What is this? I wonder if you can tell me how, <laughs> how it works, how it happens. How it happens? I don't know. <laughs> Others prefer to talk about the impacts rather than the causes of global warming. Well, what I heard about global warming is that stuff is getting warmer, you know, like the snow is not going to be as much, you know, it's going to be less and more rain I heard is going to fall. Many Canadians mention pollution as a cause and imply that the problem is an inevitable byproduct of modern life. The cars and all the pollution that we're causing in the world right now, factories, all this uh, urban stuff that we're doing is wrecking the environment. Sources are pollution and, uh, you know, uh, cars and smog and, and all of that. Just basically, you know, civilization, really. <laughs> you know what the mechanism is? Uh, no, I don't. No, not really. The 
The most common explanation offered is that pollution damages the ozone layer. Pollution wrecking our ozone? They put holes in the ozone layer. Deep hole in the ozone layer? Depletion of the ozone layer, to the best of my knowledge, is mostly pollutants. Um, getting rid of the ozone, making it warmer. It's really uh, providing, uh, you know, creating a, a huge uh, problem with the ozone. Many people talk about some combination of impacts, pollution, and ozone without offering any real answer about how global warming happens. So I want to emphasize here is those, the patterns were consistent over a lot of people. And there were, there were some basic patterns. Um, most responses to how does it work fell into a few categories. One says climate change equals warming but with no real explanation of how. Another was unnatural pollutants um, cause changes. Generally, humans are dumping chemicals and they lead to problems. Again, no connection to warming in that case, just like pollution's bad, but not a mechanistic clarity. Another is um, letting more sun in. And often, um, this is commonly associated with the ozone hole. And um, just on Saturday, I went to a Thanksgiving gathering and I was having a conversation with some strangers. And I said, hey, can you, do you know how this works? They talked about the ozone hole as the reason why we have global warming. Um, and then finally, it's just the Earth, just, you know, the Earth's warming, just the Earth doing its thing. So, um, reflecting a, a sense that it's all natural. And it, you know, so with that, with those kinds of ideas being predominant in many people's minds, um, lacking a coherent kind of explanation of how it works, is that going to help people figure out how we can solve it or, or make things better? So, I think one of the fundamental things is we need to help people understand a basic mechanism. And, Oh, let me just say, this is from one of our <coughs> recent interviews in the, uh, I think this was from the fall of 2012. Oh, it's a 2013 report, that's why the date is 2013. Um, this was a, an American interview. They did interviews at four different cities um, with about 40 people and found the same trends. These are hour-long interviews coded very carefully with, with um, an anthropological lens and the trends are very similar to what the video represents. So you would hope that we would have changed something in the last seven years or five years. Um, we're still in that same similar place, um, despite all that's happened. So I'm going to make a claim. And I'd like you all to stand up for one moment. Thank you. This is part of my exercise plan. I was trying to make you stand up. Um, <clears throat> please remain standing if you are confident that you could come forward and solve this right now. Remain standing if you could do this confidently. If you are not confident, please feel free to sit. <laughs> six, less than 60 seconds. I'm saying it is possible to explain to a person on the street in less than 60 seconds, a mechanism that they, um, that, that they can really grasp. Awesome. Two of you. Okay, I'm going to show you the second half of the video where the interviewer tried to illustrate a possibility. The Why? next set of clips shows people responding to Why? the simplifying model. The researcher read the following paragraph aloud. Experts say that global warming is caused by a blanket of carbon dioxide that surrounds the Earth and traps in heat. Many experts even refer to global warming as the carbon dioxide blanket effect. Normally, the atmosphere allows excess heat to rise away from the Earth. But by pumping tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide into the air, we are creating a layer that traps heat and keeps it from escaping into space. Heat just isn't getting out. The heat trapped by the carbon dioxide blanket is 
to raising temperatures and causing problems all over the world. We then asked questions like, how do emissions from cars and industry cause global warming? What steps could Canada take to slow down global warming? What are the main consequences of global warming? <coughs> Can you please repeat back the information you heard at the beginning of the conversation? The video excerpts you'll see next were drawn from various places in the subsequent conversations. Well, because they, they produce carbon dioxide. And they raise it, and I guess they, they, they increase the, the layer of carbon dioxide around the Earth. And then, rather, you said, rather than the, the, the Earth regulating itself, then the, you're right, the, the heat's trapped, and it just gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And our ice caps are melting, right, in Alaska. So, yeah, so that's how it does it. Carbon dioxide, obviously, caused by combustion from cars, factories, etc., raises its trapped atmosphere, and then stops the um, heat that would normally flow through the atmosphere, uh, traps it, and keeps it within the atmosphere. The emissions that are coming from cars and uh, industry uh, are carbon dioxide emissions that are creating a blanket that is uh, causing uh, the heat not to be able to escape from, from Earth. So that blanket is, is keeping uh, the, I would assume it's the sun's rays are not able to deflect back out. And as that's happening, our temperatures are increasing uh, marginally year by year by year. Global warming is caused by uh, carbon dioxide like a blanket and heat can't get out so it stays in and heats the uh, earth more than you should. All the cars here, there's thousands of cars going at once when 50 people can take a bus and it takes 50 people, 50 cars off the road. We need some kind of strong leadership that, that's willing to at least go half measure. I think that the government seriously underestimated how important this issue is to Canadians. They're trying to catch up but I think the Canadians are a little bit smarter than that. Clearly, these conversations sound very different. The interview subjects are more confident and articulate, more interested, and more constructive rather than dispirited. They are also focusing on causes rather than impacts of global warming. People in this mindset are much more likely to think productively about solutions that can reduce carbon emissions rather than expressing resignation, vague anxiety, or misdirected ideas about how to address the problem. So did you uh, agree with the, um, the narrator's comments at the end? Those conversations sounded quite different than prior to the, um, prior to that simplifying model? And, um, did you agree that those interview subjects um, seemed more confident after hearing that simple model? Was the simple model less than 60 seconds? It was. <laughs> um, did you hear that people were talking more about causes and, and they were sort of a little less confused? Uh, were they argumentative? Did they, get, did they get all political? See, it is possible to find ways using social sciences to help us improve the quality of our conversations and help to trigger a mindset that is really more open to thinking about, well, how, what can we really do? And, and that's what I think we need to find a way to practice. Um, and so, uh, any other reflections that you want to share on the, on the video? Yeah. Why doesn't carbon dioxide why doesn't carbon dioxide go out into space? Um, essentially, the, it's, it, my understanding is essentially it's gravity. I mean, the, the, the atmosphere is essentially the Earth is, give or take, a closed system. You know, we're not, we're not exchanging a whole lot of mass from the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere with space. Um, that, somebody can tell, somebody help me be clearer than that? I'm seeing a couple people nod. I'm trusting that you have expertise, probably more than me. Um, that's my understanding. It's just basically gravity doesn't let the carbon dioxide out. Yeah. Along well, with that 67 second yeah. conversation, let's say that you had Fox News produce a color 60 second presentation. Yeah. What then do you think would happen to the That's a great question. 
question. Um, I, I think I'd go back to the idea that most Americans really are interested. And most Americans, if you can, if you can get them out of, not in front of the television screen, then you can have a productive conversation. There are some, they're not going to have a productive conversation. But that's a pretty small minority overall. So I think we aim for the sort of the, the, the vast, the, the majority of folks, and do the best we can. And improve, you, you'll, if you reflect on what the narrator said, is people in this mindset are more likely to sort of cognitively think about solutions at, at scale. So, that, and that's the next place we need to talk about is what do solutions mean? Um, so I want to I want to go there. Yeah, one more comment. They, they tested the blanket as a metaphor very, very carefully. And one of the big challenges is that the greenhouse effect model, people imagine a greenhouse in their mind. But a lot of people have no idea what a greenhouse is, they just get confused. But a lot of people do know what a greenhouse is. And you know what? Greenhouses are really nice places where plants grow. So the greenhouse effect, and, and let's be clear, Thank goodness for the greenhouse effect, because Earth would not sustain life without it, right? So let's just be clear about that. However, um, as, a, as a mental model, as a mental kind of construct to explain how the world works, the greenhouse seems to get confused and integrated with the ozone hole. And so people think there's a hole in the roof of the greenhouse, it, or something like that. So the metaphors we have in mind, they get mixed in ways that make them inaccurate grossly inaccurate. The blanket doesn't seem to trigger that misunderstanding. And in, in, their, in the framework's testing. Um, and by the way, they tried a whole bunch of things, and the blanket metaphor is the only one that people could repeat back pretty with fairly good coherence, and that, that really helped them think more productively. They, they tried a bunch. So, you know, my colleagues who I'm working with say, well, aren't there any other metaphors? And the answer is no. I mean, there are, there are, we make up metaphors all the time. There are lots and lots of metaphors, but in terms of very carefully tested, um, no, there aren't. And, and Frameworks is currently doing research to try and get a really good metaphor to help us with ocean acidification. I'm really looking forward to it. We've needed it for several years, and um, we've needed it probably for decades. So, so I'm concerned about the notion of willful ignorance. If you own a coal mine in West Virginia, or you work in a coal mine in West Virginia, you yep. be kind of in denial because maybe the implications for your family's income is going to be Sure. Let's come, let's come back to that because I want to talk about solutions before we talk about that. And again, you know, 97% or so of climate scientists, they're on the same page. 6% of Americans are convinced Elvis is still alive. We're never going to get everybody, right? We, we you know. The, the <laughs> okay, I want to show this again. You don't have to use exactly the same words. You can use the metaphor effectively, and you can use your own words. But I'm gonna, I want to review some key features. This is one way of doing it pretty well. Quite simply, when we burn fossil fuels like coal and gas, we pump more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and this builds up. This buildup creates a blanket effect, trapping in heat around the world. If nothing's done to halt the process, the planet we leave our children will be hotter with more violent weather, fewer species, and disrupted ecosystems. So I want to unpack that a little bit. This is what we call the design specs of the heat trapping blanket. Um, the, the metaphor makes choices, or the, or the phrases that I just shared make choices. They ignore methane, which is really important. We get it. But we focus on something because cognitively people can handle it. So it makes choices. There is one major cause, one major driver of global warming. And the problem is caused by specific activities. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, humans are emitting all this carbon dioxide and it's a real problem. And what's the solution then? Sure. <laughs> 
you know, less humans or hold your breath. Well, that's not actually where the solution is going to come from. We really, it's, it's about fossil fuels, so we need to name it. And people get confused by the term fossil fuels, so let them know it's oil, it's natural gas, it's coal, gasoline, other petroleum products. Um, you got to let them know that because for many people, if you don't give them that anchor, they, they won't necessarily follow you. Um, the most important variable is how much CO2 we emit and the essential mechanisms. We already commented on the blanket. People understand blankets. People understand that if it's warm and you can't take the blanket off, that makes you uncomfortable. The people, people seem to get that. So the blanket metaphor really seems to work. So is a metaphor perfect? Of course not. Metaphor isn't the thing. But this tested metaphor can help people cogitate in ways that are likely, not always, but they're, they're more likely to spur people to coherence and to thinking productively. Um, so one of the other questions, okay, so it's great, but can you use it in a real conversation or a real, you know, in my case, again, an aquarium. So suppose we're talking about a coral reef or turtles or uh, bluefin tuna. So this example is just saying, sure you can. You know, if we burn fossil, as we burn fossil fuels like oil and gas, it changes the ocean temperature enough to disrupt where tunas can breed. Burning fossil fuels emits excess carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide acts as a blanket, trapping heat. The ocean absorbs much of that excess heat, making it warmer too. At current rates, we're burning fossil fuels. The Gulf of Mexico, one of bluefin tuna's breeding grounds, is predicted to get up to four and a half degrees warmer by the end of the century. Scientists are concerned this will disrupt the tuna's breeding with serious consequences for tuna and other species that are part of their ecosystem. So you can imagine in an aquarium setting or translate to other kinds of animals or habitats, salt marshes, um, etc. You can find ways of using these pieces of the metaphor, those, those design specs, in your conversations. Um, it's also really easy to do it kind of well, but not quite get there. Excess carbon dioxide is getting into our atmosphere. It acts like a blanket that traps heat over time. Our atmosphere is getting warmer. If you use it like that, you're missing some things. Where does the excess carbon dioxide come from? You've got to remember, it's from burning fossil fuels. And what's wrong with it getting warmer? We, we need to connect to the disruptions to at least one, and probably not a long list. Pick, you know, pick, pick the one that is appropriate to your context in the moment, so that, you know, over time as the atmosphere is getting warmer, that warmth causes more evaporation. With more evaporation, there's more moisture in the atmosphere available to fall in really powerful rain events that can cause damaging floods. So you pick floods and make the link really clearly to it. So people, we, we talk about something called the invisible process. So often in our, in our um, communications we say, well, carbon dioxide is bad. You know, it's like, well, why? Because there's some black box going on and, and it's bad. Um, so help people, you know, give, give the steps that show the connections. And it's and in less than 60 seconds. So each of us, and this gets back to you and me, you know, each of us, can try to use this metaphor um, in our conversations about climate change. Maybe you're Thanksgiving. Um, and we need to go beyond using the metaphor. We also have to have some fun. So, so solutions can be fun. And strategically, when we talk about solutions, we need to do several things. We really need to talk about solutions that are at the scale of the problem. So here's, here's a typical scenario. Um, we're at a coral reef exhibit, and we're talking about coral reefs. They're so beautiful. They have so much biodiversity. It takes a long, long time for them to grow. And you know, as the oceans warm, there are more bleaching events. And you know, isn't that terrible? So what can I do? Oh, well, change your light bulb. <laughs> you just lost credibility for anybody who knows very much about the issue. Because changing light bulbs is just insufficient. It's not a bad thing. I recommend we change light bulbs. Um, to, to the most efficient that we can, you know, get light out of. You know, it's not that I don't want people to have light, but um, let's, let's get to some bigger solutions that are also fun. 
I'll give you a couple examples that I like, and I hope you'll teach me some more. Um, I also think it's another point is, you know, again, I work at New England Aquarium, so people pay to come in. So you pay an admission price to come in to visit New England Aquarium. From the moment you start that process, how are you thinking of yourself? I want to get my money's worth. That's a consumer mindset. We have a very tough job because we really want to stimulate a civic. We're citizens. We are all citizens. We're also all consumers. But can we foreground the idea of being citizen more than foregrounding the idea of being consumers? That would be to me exciting because we are a democracy and we do get to we do get to participate. Um, not only through voting, voting is you know the sort of hallmark of of uh, democracy. We, we get to have a voice in our towns. We get to have a voice in our states. We get to have a voice in our communities in many, many ways. And we can choose to use the voice or not. But we can, we can think of ourselves as citizens and, and, and that, that could be valuable. And the reason, the reason for presenting regional level solutions is for many people that we'll have conversations with. Um, if you go straight to a carbon tax at a federal level, that's sort of way beyond what most people think, oh, I could participate in making that happen. It's sort of too big a leap for most people to think about. But um, thinking of something a little lower scale than that, and I'm not saying a carbon tax isn't a good idea, um, but it's certainly worth discussing. Um, but that's probably not going to work for, for most of our audiences to really help them think about their own sense of being empowered to participate in the unfolding story of how we shape our future. And I think if we can find ways of talking about solutions, orienting people to their own sense of citizenship, orienting them to how the mechanism works, and talk about solutions at scales that are bigger than what I think our patterns have been, I think we can create change. So I want to go back a, a step to talking about ways that experts and the public think differently about these issues. Um, experts understand that solutions need to come from reducing carbon emissions. The public tends to think, if you say, well, what can we do to help the earth or what can we do to prevent climate change? Most people will say recycling. Just ask, you can find this for yourself. Um, experts really understand that this is quite serious and because of the long timelines, we've got to get started. It's urgent. And uh, the public thinks, yeah, we ought to consider something. Um, the experts think that policy really is necessary. We really do. We need to use the free market. You know, we need to use the market system and the power of the market to create change. Experts get that. Economists, leading economists get that. Uh, the public thinks that, you know, we can do 50 things. The, the top 50 things we can do at home are what we can do. So there are some real disconnects here. This is what Frameworks Institute staff colleagues will call a gaps between expert understanding and public understanding, and these are things we need to work on. So this is a way I like to encourage people to think about solutions. When you're having a conversation about climate change, and it comes around, and I hope it will come around to what can we do, um, one common phrase is there is no silver bullet. Anybody know where that comes from? From Dracula or from... Uh, or from Lone Ranger, right, right, yeah, or, yeah, anyway, um, there's no single answer. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier that this is more like a marathon, you know, we, we, we train and train and train and, you know, if you train enough, you have a chance of winning, and if you don't win, you're still in good shape, you know, but we, but we need to do it over time. It's not, you know, we don't get to exercise one day and we're done. We don't get to solve climate change one day and we're done. We need to sustain attention day after day, month after month, year after year, for generations to come. So we, we need to get started. And the box is here. Um, you, I mean, I, I hope this is fairly intuitive. We can act across multiple different kinds of industries, from the energy sector to agriculture to commerce to, to building construction um, to how we manage waste. You know, so there are all these sectors going down the side. And then there are different kinds of scales. And we, can, we can do individual things. Um, but if that's all we do, we're missing lots of opportunities. So let's explore those opportunities in our own, you know, like, this is where, this is where it can get fun. Um, let me just see where I'm going for a second. 
Um, let, me, let me try to give you an example um, that I think is really fun, and I've been considering this recently. So I'm going to start from a different perspective and think about the box that's transportation at the city level, maybe even the state level. And I'd like you to imagine a world in which you never had to spend even five seconds, never, five seconds, looking for a parking space. Who would like to live in that world? <laughs> five seconds, not even. You wouldn't have to spend a minute. You, wouldn't have to, you, ne you would never have to park a car. You're for that, right? Never have to park a car. Now, how many of you um, are using your cars right now? No, 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 I mean, I mean right now. How many of you are using your cars right now? How many of you have a car? How many of you are paying insurance right now for that car? You like that? Paying for a car, it's sitting there doing nothing. Suppose we never had to pay for a car when it wasn't doing anything. Most cars spend 95% of their lifetime sitting parked, turned off. You still pay the insurance. They still rust. You've got to take care of them, even if they're just sitting parked. We pay for that. And we spend all this time parking. We spend all this time in traffic. Inventing the automobile was such a lovely idea, wasn't it? When we get traffic accidents. Okay. Well, how, how does this connect back? Well, I think we could design a transportation system with current technology that could be 80% more efficient. And I think it'd be fun. We could use our roads that already exist and treat them like rails. And we could treat cars that already exist and treat them like trolley cars. And we could use the technology that companies are developing for cars to drive themselves. And we could use the technology that's in my pocket and I could say, I like a car to take me home. And my little device in my pocket would say, car will be there in seven minutes and 39 seconds. And I wait seven minutes, 39 seconds, car's there, I hop in, hey, my friend's in the car because it's going home to somewhere near my house. And we ride it like a trolley car, and it uses the roads, and, um, and I hop out of the car, and I don't even have to say goodbye. I just go home. And I don't have to park it. And there's somebody else a few blocks away. It goes and gets them and takes them where they want to go. And when you get a density of cars and a density of uh, computer you know, mapping so that the computer algorithms know where all the people are, they know where they want to go, they know where the cars are, they know, and, they, and it optimizes a route. And if there's a, if there's a snarl up for some reason, it just routes things around it. And the nice thing is, you could start with just one of these. You don't have to take away anybody's right to own a car. Everybody can still buy a car and pay for it when it's sitting idle, if they want to. So let me ask you a question. I said this is fun. Do you think this is a fun conversation? Some of you do. Some of you are willing to say you do. Some of you are shy. Um, that's the, this is a kind of conversation that I think we should find a way of having. Conversations about things like this that, and, and why, how do I get to 80%? I, I'm guessing. But just think about it. If, if cars are, are parked you know, on the order of 95% of their, their lifetimes, well, that, then a whole lot of cars could do the work. Those cars could be working instead of being parked, so we could have a lot fewer cars on the road. And cars that are driving and don't have to turn their engine off and on and off and on, uh, uh, they, they, their engines operate more efficiently. And I think we could reduce the number of cars on the road tremendously, increase efficiency of the vehicles that are on the road. There would be no distracted driving, so it actually could make the, make the roads a lot safer, as well as less congested. So in less congestion, everything can flow more freely. I, I, don't, I haven't done the calculations. Probably Rocky Mountain Institute has done that. I don't know. But, um, but it would be a whole lot more efficient. Now, does anybody have a similar kind of conversation that you can lead us in for agriculture or for buildings or for something? You got something well, I wanted to uh, one plus your car thing. I hate school buses sitting idle all day long except the there you morning go. in the afternoon and then all summer long sitting right. idle. And I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be part of the public transportation system that saves everybody some money somehow. Right, right. Except you, you, 
could apply it to school buses. You, the, I, I just read uh, an article from Forbes from a couple days ago that said in a few cities they're going to start experimenting with self-driving cars being used just in, in very local areas where um, I think there may be pedestrian access kind of zones where there are just a few buses and pedestrian access. They're going to start experimenting. Um, but this article is saying we're still decades away. I hope we're not. I hope we're, I, I hope we're only a decade away. Um, and I think the legal system is the biggest, the biggest hurdle. But I don't, I don't, I mean, this is still fantasy to me. I, I'm excited about it, but it's not my world, so. Does anybody else have another really fun conversation that could get us in one of these boxes that you don't talk about very often? Oh, actually, let me see. Who's had this conversation before tonight? One. Okay, good. Two. About the cars, yeah. Okay, so public transportation. Okay, so um, using that as a model, does anybody have a building conversation or an agriculture or a food and landscape conversation that you could lead us in? Yeah. Um, I don't know a huge amount about this, but maybe somebody else in the room does. Um, I was recently just visiting a farm school in Appalachia. We were talking about. Can you speak up a little? Yeah, sorry. Um, I was visiting a farm school in Athol, Mass, that I'm applying to for next year, and um, the people there were talking about how plowing on farms, which obviously has been going on for years and years and years, um, is actually can be really horrible for the soil after a long period of time because right. constantly turning it over kills the life in the soil, which doesn't help the farmers, so it doesn't help us, and it obviously doesn't help the environment. So. They're working on this new kind of farming, or it's not super new, but it's also not super popular. And um, that's permaculture, and it's based on working with the environment instead of working um, against the environment, which farmers have accidentally a lot of time done for years by the clearing huge parts of land and turning the soil over and over again. And um, the permaculture doesn't, when you see permaculture in action, it hardly looks like a farm. It looks a lot more like a, like a woodland area um, because nature has the ability to kind of, I mean, obviously it grows things itself. It's a beautiful system. That, that's how we have Mosley State Park and Newburyport. And that just keeps itself going. So farmers have been using this permaculture and that natural model to sort of to grow vegetables. And they'll plant seeds and just allow and it takes time to you know, transform your farm into this setting, but they allow nature to work with itself and work within its own system to produce a lot of really amazing crops that we can actually consume and, and use without harming the environment, without harming the soil. And I think that's really interesting. I'm like, I hardly know anything about the science of it, but just, just talking about it with these farmers is really cool, and I think it'd be cool to See what else people have to say about permaculture. So, quick question for you: Did the farmers like it? Um, some of them did. Some <laughs> of them were, were really into the idea and like hoping that their the farm that we were on would you know yeah. go in that direction. But the guy running the place was like, oh, I really don't want to talk about this, and you kind of tell that because it's hard. The people who have to transform their farms to that, it's like. It takes so much yeah, time. Yeah, the transition, the transition's really hard. Yeah. So one of the things I really like about that is people are already doing it. And I think that the, the transportation example that I used, um, the trouble is it's still fancy in the future, right? So I think we need to get down to roots. And I said earlier, it's helpful to, to think on a scale that um, people can imagine themselves participating in. So I want to share a quick example of, um, anybody heard of Audrey Schulman? Anybody heard of H-E-E-T-M-A.org? Home Energy Efficiency Team, Massachusetts. From, you know, from me. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> um, Audrey Schulman, she has kids, and, and she said, you know, I want the world to be better for them, and I, I don't know what to do. I'm, a, I'm an author. And she said, well, you know, but I have a house. You know, I really like barn raisings. But we don't need to, we're not going to raise a barn. So what would a 21st century equivalent be? So she had a party. She invited a bunch of people over including a couple people who knew what they were doing. And they air sealed and insulated. They changed every light bulb in her house. They, you heard all about this. Well, it was very cool. They had a good time. They had a party. They learned some stuff. They, got to, they built some new relationships. 
And they did it in 180 places. That's scale. And it's imaginable. You can imagine finding, you, you can imagine inviting people to your own home or participating in somebody else's. So that's at a scale that's both much, much bigger than, put out the recycling, please. You know, and it's community building. And so I really like that story, what's happening. Does this mean I have to leave? I don't know what, I don't know what happened to Mike. Oh, is it? Oh, you can, it's still working? Oh, it sounds different to me. Like, all right, well, I'll, I'll use my teacher voice. I, I, just, I just checked the time, and I realize I'm running really late, so I want to I move through very fast now. Um, but my challenge to you is to find ways in your conversations to use the blanket metaphor and those pieces that we talked about, the, the heat trapping blanket metaphor specs, and to find some of these boxes that you've never talked about before and bring them into your conversation. I'll tell you one other really quick one. Todd Hines and colleagues started a company in Watertown or Brighton somewhere, and they developed an aftermarket hybrid system for vans. They want to sell it to FedEx and UPS and you know companies that buy thousands of thousands of vans. And this captures braking energy and uses it for acceleration and improves the fuel economy by about 20% on the vans. And they can install it in a couple hours, you know, aftermarket when they're installing all their paint jobs and shelving and whatever they install. There's a there's an example that's a corporate kind of example. It's it's taking an idea and and creating a business out of it. So I like that one as well. It, efficiency remains very very important. It's still cheaper to find ways of improving life and using less energy than it is to create more electrons flowing. So let me just say, conversations really do matter, and I want to—I think I mentioned this earlier, but I want to emphasize that um, Americans are saying, and this is according to Yale and George Mason University, um, just over 25% of us say we talk about issues of global warming with family and friends very often. Most people almost never talk about it. That stands in contrast to the level of interest when, when asked, are you interested, are you concerned? People say, yeah, I'm concerned. How concerned do you think your neighbors are? Well, not very. Um, because we don't talk about it. It's like cancer a few decades ago. It was, you know, if you had a cancer diagnosis, you wouldn't want to tell anybody because you know, that would look bad. And we've sort of come a long way since then, and now it's okay to talk about cancer. Well, you know what, it's okay to talk about climate change too. And there are ways to do it that it can be fun and productive. And I hope that you have some ideas that are new for you as you do that. Um, this is important. It's hard to push a train. It's hard to push the climate system, too. Once you get the train started, it's, it reaches a point where it's hard to stop it. And the climate system, too. So we really do, um, it, you know, the climate system is a lot bigger than a train. Um, so we need to get moving on the slowing down side. I want to just mention um, this project, NYAKI. It's the best tasting acronym ever. <laughs> the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. It's a five year project funded by your tax dollars through the National Science Foundation. And I appreciate that NSF is funding some climate change education work. Um, it's a multidisciplinary project with, with um, ocean scientists, social scientists, and interpreters, um, or I would say experts in. Uh, informal um, education meeting, meaning museum or non-school education settings. Um, and I'm really, really excited that, you know, what I've been sharing really I've learned through this project. Um, and um, our key audiences for that are educators from the museum world. And I think if we do train enough voices in proven communication techniques, we can change the national discourse to make it more positive. And will it answer your question? somebody's, you know, livelihood is tied up with coal. Um, maybe not, but I think we could move the nation anyway, and I think that that would be a good thing. And I, I guess I'd add to that fi a final comment, which is, I don't think the oil companies and the coal companies and the gas companies are bad people. They're part of the same world we are. They want the world to be healthy. They want to provide energy so that we can have the things that I started with. You know, we appreciate 
our lights and our transportation and our electronics. And, you know, coal is still helping to run those for many people around the country. And it's not, you know, I don't think anybody wants to suddenly turn off all that stuff. I mean, that would be pretty darn catastrophic, too. So um, I, think, I think portraying the us or them and participating in that, that sort of dialogue probably isn't going to get us there either. I think we really need to remember that um, people, there are, there are those who are actively sowing doubt that I think is quite destructive and unfortunate, um, but that's such a small part of the total number of people. I think we have a lot of people we can have great conversations with and make a real substantial difference. If you want to reach me, there's my contact information. You can find out more about the Yankee Project at those two websites. Climate Interpreter is um, not branded as a Nyaki site. It's a partner, but um, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And uh, I'll take a couple questions. I'm sorry I've taken so long. Yes? Speaking of dialogue, I read an editorial in the Daily News about the lack of public officials who attend this thing. I was just wondering, is there anyone here from uh, a city official here? Or, uh, I just um, learned for the first time that Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island, did I get that right, has been giving a speech on the Senate floor once a week for 50 weeks. Very poorly attended, but he is out there saying this is important in a, in a very public way. Well, perhaps, you know, people who voted, maybe they would contact the folks that they voted for and have them come the next time. Yep. Two weeks away. Get a phone call, send an email. Who's, who's ever reached out to a, your local representative. M many of you, good, good. Well, you know what? An invitation is worth a lot. It says, it says I care about this issue. It's worth a lot. And if enough people do it, I think people will start, start coming. How many of you have heard about the uh, proposed Massachusetts uh, fuel tax based on carbon? Good, a lot of you have. That's, that's an interesting one to watch and to participate in. Um, participate in the dialogue about that. Other, another question or two. Yeah? Your last remark was that um, you know that there are those sowing doubt about the science of climate change. Yeah. <clears throat> Who is funding those scientists? I'm thinking specifically of Dr. Willie Soon, the astrophysicist. Who is funding them to sow this down? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I know there are people who, who follow the money, and I, I don't. I, I have read Merchants of Doubt, which I recommend. I, I bet a lot of you have read that already. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I, I hear the Koch brothers' name come up a lot. Um, I'm sure there are, sure there are others. Um, yeah, I don't know.
Are you, um, is the aquarium involved in the upcoming uh, May 2014 conference in, at Antioch University? And it's a conference uh, bringing together municipal, focusing on municipalities and, and building resilience within municipalities. And there's a, the third day is for educators in particular. If you're not aware of it or involved in it, I would encourage you to, to go to the Antioch website and find out about it. This is the kind of thing that would be perfectly suited for such an event, I would think. Great. Well, I, I'd be happy to give you a card and you can, we can, you can uh, encourage me to point me there. My only trouble is my bandwidth is limited. I can't do it all. Um, but, but we have a lot of colleagues you know, in, in our network and yeah. there may be somebody who would be available. Yes? Uh, you've mentioned dialogue a few times. Is there any national initiative, whether it be under the auspices of the NNOCCI or anything else, to have dialogue going on throughout the country around the key questions? Um, I'm not fully aware. There are, I, I'm aware that there have been a number of dialogue oriented um, kinds of projects. Um, generally working on an experimental level, um, there was some European work on a, a project a few years ago where they really tried to get a whole bunch of dialogues going all in parallel and actually linking them over the internet so they could see each other. Um, so I'm not aware of a national scale effort. I think that would be very expensive and to, to really coordinate well. Um, so our approach is try to get it to bubble up from, I talk about it as experimental, you know, if we get enough educators learning about the approach that we're, we're trying to practice and practicing with it, some of them are going to start getting really good at it and they'll report back to each other, I did this, I had these great conversations, people were so appreciative and that will support those who feel more tentative, which, and there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of educators who really wants to engage in the kind of work I'm alluding to, um, but they feel tentative for, for some good reasons, um, and sometimes for some not, so some emotional reasons that may not be fully founded. Um, but I think success stories are going to be really helpful, and we're starting to see those. So somebody over here had another question. Yes? I was uh, wondering if you see any Um, 
when you get much younger than that, I would say um, pedagogically or, or developmentally, it's really important to be cautious. Um, it's easy to inadvertently scare children, and there's no point in that. It's you know we, we really need to um, nurture their development before we start talking about global issues that are really um, that, that bear threats. So, um, but the high school students that I, I've been, I've seen a great deal of interest, um, and I think that that's hopeful. Um, I do not want to give up on the adults. Yeah. I think we need we need leadership from adults, um, and we we also need to be growing next generation leaders. One more? I don't see any hands. All right, so um, I want to leave you with a challenge. Thanksgiving is coming. It can be one of the most challenging audiences, your family, your close friends gather. I challenge you to uh, try and have a really productive, fun conversation where you bring in some of the content that you've been learning, both from me, but also from your prior speakers. <coughs> And um, I really do hope you have fun with that and enjoy your Thanksgiving and be thankful for the amazing uh, systems that sustain all of us. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. That was a great presentation and I thank you all for coming. And I, I just have a tip if you're going to be sitting at a table with a conservative relative. I, I was captive on a sailboat with a fan of Rush Limbaugh for about 10 days up in Alaska. We actually had a great conversation about climate change and uh, I actually got him to come around, but one of my strategies was to uh, get him thinking about, well, how do they know all this stuff is happening? I says, well, you remember Ronald Reagan at Star Wars? He goes, oh yeah, he was a great president. And I said, well, all those satellites that they put up there to uh, fight the Russians, they're using those to measure sea level across the planet and they can see all these different things and polar ice caps and as soon as you heard Ronald Reagan then he was listening. So there's your way. <laughs>